Hey guys, I finally made my own keyboard, so let me introduce to you the chaba, which means tea leaf. It's a long story of why I call this the chaba, so I won't go into the details. The Chaba is a hand-wired 44-key columnar staggered split unibody keyboard inspired by the Corne, the Lily 58, the Revwing, and the Ocean Wave. The body is made of 3D printed plastic, while the bottom is laser-cut acrylic and has RGB. The keyboard is coupled with Kale Rail switches with Keychron OSA keycaps and has a Colmac layout. So here's how the story of how the Chaba came to be. It's a very long story so sit back, relax and use the chapters if you want to TLDR this video but it's a cool story so don't TLDR, okay? So before we start, a disclaimer, um, I am not a keyboard pro or any pro at keyboard or firm wearing or soldering or electronicsing or anything. I'm just a guy who wants to make my own keyboard. It all started after I watched this video. I thought, okay, maybe making a keyboard isn't that complicated if it doesn't involve PCBs, so I went on to design how the keyboard will look like on paper. At first, I thought I'd have something like an N-Gage or a Dreamcast controller with an OLED screen in the middle. Yeah, I'm that generation. But in the end, opted for a non-OLED version since I didn't have enough pins on the microcontroller. After the overall idea was made, first thing to do was to go to Keyboard Layout Editor, find a GitHub with someone who has made a corny JSON file, copy-paste the JSON code into the editor, and do some more editing. And I mean like a lot of editing. Even if the layout looks nice, it doesn't mean it will translate perfectly to the CAD drawing in the next step. So for example, F here is the first key. Uh, it's complicated but not so complicated if you can guess the patterns, I guess. I have to admit this was fun because you get to daydream how your keyboard is going to look like. After that, I went to plate and case builder, copy pasted the JSON stuff, and then clicked on draw my cat. Now that looks sweet. Save the drawing as DXF, then download Fusion 360 community version and import the file. Fusion 360 is free to use with some limitations and is one of the new skills that I learned throughout this experience. So after importing the DXF file, I was like, okay, now what? Because... Fusion 360 or any CAD software was very overwhelming for new people like me. So I went through a Fusion 360 crash course on YouTube, specifically this playlist. It's a how to use Fusion 360 in 30 days playlist and has nice chunks of projects to work on. I went through the videos over a few days just up until day 7 I think. After that, I had the basic skills of how to do 3D modeling and I mean like really basic stuff, nothing fancy. After having some level of confidence, now comes the second fun part of making the keyboard, which is 3D modeling. 3D modeling is both fun and frustrating for me because I always find myself wrestling with Fusion 360 to draw a line or not extruding something properly. Since my keyboard was going to be a mirrored version of one side, I deleted one half and worked on the frame size and shape and just mirrored it back. Uh, by the way, I set my frame thickness for 5mm because I thought I wanted the key to be as small as possible while still having 44 keys. Uh, I also wanted to have legs on the back because I loved how the legs on the rev wing made typing much more comfortable. While doing all of this 3D modeling, I basically referenced a whole lot of stuff from the first YouTube video I mentioned in this video like what's the thickness for the plate and hole sizes and other stuff but I also included real world measurements like how high my microcontroller is or what's the supposed distance of my switches to the bottom plate etc etc this took a few days to do and was super fun okay so the 3D model is complete and now I have to get this made first thing I did was to go on Facebook join a local 3D print group and ask around who can print the model and cut the acrylic for the bottom plate. I also had to ask if they can print 30cm models because some printers have small beds just up until 25cm. 
there were questions like what kind of material to use, fill-ins, etc. But I just kind of went with the cheapest option and told the printer guy, um, as long as it's sturdy, it's okay. I also tried to find vendors that could do acrylic cutting and laser etching for the bottom plate. Um, to be honest, I didn't expect acrylic to be expensive compared to 3D printing, but it turns out that's not the case. I learned a lot in this process, like having to save each layer as DXF files to be sent for laser cutting and etching. While doing this, one of the 3D print vendors just straight out suggested why not make an all acrylic keyboard and I thought, you yeah, know, well, wait, mm, why not? So yeah, but that's another story for another time. In the end, I ordered the acrylic stuff from my user seller, um, XE, as they were kind enough to bundle my order with theirs. Now for a shopping spree for parts. Since none of the parts are available from just one vendor, this was what I had to buy from different sources. Which means that I had to have separate shipping for each order, which made up like 10-15% to of my whole keyboard cost. So up to here, the keyboard is about 350 ringgit, I think. Uh, just bare bones minus the switches and keycaps would be around 160 ringgit or so. Time and effort to this stage was probably around 40 to 50 hours, give or take. Oh, and while I was waiting for the parts to arrive, I had to figure out how the wiring would be. So for this, I went to Keyboard Firmware Builder, uploaded the JSON I made on the Keyboard Layout Editor, and rewired the whole thing. Originally, I wanted to make the build simple with a wiring of 4 rows and 12 columns, but because I wanted the keyboard to have RGB and also maybe OLED, I rewired the thing to 8 rows and 6 columns. The long story is, a Pro Micro has 24 pins on it with only 20 pins usable for stuff, and I'll need as much pins for my columns and rows. The plan was to use these pins for rows, these pins for columns, this one here for RGB, and I'll just skip OLED for now. Well, that was the plan until I actually started wiring them, but I'll talk about that later. So, after about two weeks of waiting for all the parts to arrive, now is the time to build the chaba! First off, I push the switches into the switch holes, then do the diodes, as in wrap them onto a precision screwdriver to create a loop so it's easier to solder them onto the switches. I did this on all of the switches to create a total of 8 rows. This took about an hour or so to do. Next was to wire the columns, um, I stripped out a 10 core wire cable and used a wire stripper to strip the wires to be soldered to the column pins. This was kind of a pain because it wasn't easy figuring out where to strip the wire. The sleeve moves around and I don't know how to use the wire stripper properly I guess. I just did what worked, so wiring the columns probably took about 2 hours to do. Yeah, this part looks very short, but actually, in total, it was like a 3 hour job. Next was to build the firmware. Um, in general, I've had bad experience with writing QMK firmware because I don't really read documentation, just do a lot of trial and error. First was to define the columns and rows and what keys are supposed to be there in the chaba.h file. Then set up the rules of what to turn on and what not to turn on in the rules.mk file. By the way, I turned on mouse keys and via support here. And then define the pins that I'll be using in the config.h file as per what I initially planned. And make sure I have RGB pin defined as well. Then I just made a dummy key map with 5 layers as that's about how many layers I need for my 40% keybobs. Um, once all of these 4 files are done, it's time to compile. Since the firmware could be compiled, then I thought it was okay for me to start to wire the microcontroller, so I went and did that. That took another 30 minutes, and then it's time to flash the chaba. Flash is done, do some testing, and some keys don't work. In fact, the first two rows don't work, which means... Ah yes, debugging. So after a whole day of thinking and recompiling and testing, I found out two things. One, my row pins D1 and D0 weren't working, so I moved these to pins F4 and F5. 
I still don't know why D1 and D0 wasn't working and I wasn't able to find anything about why they don't work. Uh, a friend mentioned D1 and D0 was probably for power or something but I, I don't know. Two, uh, was I have to turn off via support in the rules.mk file so that the microcontroller doesn't save the key map in the EEP ROM. I'll have to clear the EEP ROM every time when I want to flash a new key map onto the controller. I also don't know how to get VIA to detect the keyboard or how to have a proper JSON file to be loaded into VIA, so in the end I just decided to go with pure QMK. And since I decided to go with pure QMK, it's time to write the key map. <sighs> write the key map. Thankfully, I've done this before when making firmware for ZMK and I've used VIA a couple of times to remap keyboards from QWERTY layouts. So it only took an hour for my first time to write my whole key map in QMK. I also ran into a few issues when the thumb keys didn't work, so I had to reconfigure the key matrix in the chaba.h file. Um, this required a few trial and errors as well. So this was my first typing test on the chaba. Uh, no keycaps for the win. Keys are done, connections are okay, nothing has been on fire yet, so now it's time to RGB. Okay, just to be safe and to save the trouble of retrying things down the line, I tested a single strip of RGB on the D3 pin for data, and it works! Cool. Then it was just a small matter of painfully cutting the strip into smaller LEDs and then rewire them together. I did this so that I have all the RGB at the edges of the bottom instead of the middle because I won't get higher words per minute if the RGB is in the middle. And after another hour, we now have light. Delicious RGB light. Alright, now it's time to screw the 3D print chaba parts together. Um, I use M2 screws for this because when I designed the plate and frame in Fusion 360, I was contemplating between using M3 or M2 screws. Since the frame itself was only 5mm thick and I was worried a larger screw might break the plastic frame, I opted to use M2 screw holes. Screwing M2 screws into the plastic was hard, especially since the screws were flat and not pointy ones which means I had to screw in and push them down so it goes into the holes. Along the way, I realized that I'm not going to be able to unscrew these screws because they're screwed in too tight and in fact I stripped two of the screw heads which means I'll be in deep trouble if a wire becomes attached from the controller because I can't get to the controller wires and yes, one of the columns didn't work and I had to solder it back from the window hole here which uh, by the way I, I have a window hole? Uh, yes, I have a window acrylic that was supposed to go into this slot before I screw the plate and frame together, so whatever, man. I'll just glue this onto the face plate from the top. I, I'm like, I'm so done. I'm so done. In hindsight, I remembered I had a 2mm drill bit and should have drilled a pre-hole before screwing the parts in. Well, that's one lesson learned. Alright, from the final screwing of the 3D print parts, I had to wait for a few more days for the final parts to come, which were the acrylic bottom plate and legs and their screws and standoffs. When the acrylic parts arrived, they were beautiful. It was just like what I imagined they would be. And just putting the acrylic bottom without even screwing it on is just beautiful. Chaba! So anyway, I broke the bottom leg of one of the sides because I underestimated how a piece of acrylic that has less than a millimeter for its whole walls can actually break. I mean, you can't really see or notice that on a drawing, but logically and realistically, it would break, so another lesson learned. 
So in the end, luckily I had two sets of legs and ended up using thicker pieces as legs. Problem solved. I also glued the acrylic window on top because, again, I can't open the 3D parts anymore because I stripped two or three of the screws. Um, I originally designed the windows to be pushed in underneath the top plate. Well, looks okay either way. By the way, I also thought about painting the acrylic with frost paint on the parts that has RGB for light diffusion, but I skipped that too because I'm just happy with the bright blaring underglow RGB right now. So this is the completed Chaba. And this is how it sounds. Yes, it's quiet because I'm using Kale Whale Silent Tactile Switches. Sorry for those who were expecting ASMR typing sounds, but in any case, I, if I'm not mistaken, 3D print keeps don't sound nice anyway because of the hollow plastic body. I think lah. All in all, it took about a month from I'ma do this to I did a thing for this Chaba project. Probably about 70 to 90 hours of work, about 500 ringgit in total for stuff I bought, and another 10 to 20 hours thinking and making this video. Before this, I would usually say I assembled my keyboards because they come in parts that other people have taken time to design and test. This was my first time figuring out how the keyboard would look like, how to design it from scratch, learning from the build, and overall being satisfied with what the Chaba is. Especially with the layout because this is the layout that I love from all the keyboards that I have. I've enjoyed every minute of designing and building the Chaba and I'm happy with my messy Chaba despite the questionable wiring and soldering and build and design flaws, but I'm just happy with it. Okay, that's all. Thanks for watching this very long video till the end. Nagaraku ご視聴ありがとうございました.